Uh, welcome to the Liz McMullen Show. I have a returning guest, Dana Hankins. She is always surfing, no, <laughs> sailing the seas <laughs> um, and lives her, her life on a boat. And you said that it's been a year that you've been doing this? Cool. I've been living aboard and traveling the world since 1999. Oh. I started in Seattle a long, long time ago, but it's been almost a year since the last time I had a a sort of fixed place to keep the boat. I've been traveling up and down the eastern seaboard, up into Maine as far as Winter Harbor, and down the coast as far as Cape Fear, North Carolina. Wow. I love sailing. It's beautiful. It really is. It's a great sensation. Like, But I, I've... I've always been, I guess, attracted to water, very into water. Um, oddly enough, uh, I'm a city girl, and I grew up along the Hudson and Hoboken, and um, I now live in a beach community. And it's so funny, I'm like only a few blocks away from both the bay and the ocean. And you would think, when I was younger, I was always by the ocean, in the ocean, swimming and whatnot. But... I actually spend less time there than than you would imagine, but I still remember how much I liked um, being on a yacht on the on the water and you know going for a swim and that kind of stuff. My relationship with the water really did change between my childhood and my adulthood being on a boat, partly because I was a, I was a swimmer all my life. I was a swimmer in high school as far as actual racing and such. And then I got onto a boat in Seattle where the water temperature is usually about 46 degrees and there's no going swimming in that. You will get hypothermia so fast. So for years I was on the water and never in it. And I sailed down the coast to San Francisco. Water is still too cold to go swimming. And then it wasn't until I sailed across the Pacific to the Hawaii that I got that amazing joy I had dreamed of, of jumping off my boat into the water and going for a swim. Now, on the East Coast over here, there's a lot more swimming to be done. I've I've gotten really good at getting in and out of the boat on a rope ladder. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm integrating my my childhood and my adulthood version of boat of being on the water. And in the water. That's so cool. That's such a yeah. groovy thing. So um how does being um a sail uh, impact your writing? Well, it gives me a lot of time to think. One of the great things about sailing is that it's demanding in this sort of low intensity way most of the time. Um, Some people like to say that sailing is hours and hours of boredom punctuated by moments of sheer terror. And that's, that's not a completely inaccurate way of characterizing it. You'll just be sailing along, you get everything set, and things are kind of taking care of themselves. And all you're doing is sort of scanning, scanning the wind on the water, uh, scanning the sails and the shape of them, making sure everything's going well, feeling how the, the water is reacting to the rudder to see if maybe you, you need to trim your sails differently. All of this stuff is sort of this background analysis that's going on constantly, but it leaves me with a whole section of my brain that can just imagine. And I've been able to do so much more thinking through of what I want to write than when I'm doing a full-time job and, and spending a lot of my time, like, I don't know, putting my mental energies to use on somebody else's behalf. Mm -hmm. more or less. I've been able to just go into the writing with a really, really great idea of what it is I want to say. My first two books, I wrote and wrote and wrote. I wrote one and a half times as many words as ended up in the final drafts. And I just, I have my third book. It's actually at my editor, with my editor right now. I'm hoping to get it back in the next couple weeks for edits. But that one I wrote really, really straightforwardly because I had spent several months of sailing, working the whole thing out, getting to know the characters in my mind, getting to know their hearts before I got to the end of the book. Before that, I was used to, I was the, you know, by the seat of your pants kind of writer who would just jump in. By the end of the book, I would actually get to know the people. Mm -hmm. So then I'd have to go back to the beginning and rewrite 
to fill in all of the things I didn't know about them till I'd written them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm a very circuitous, um, verbal person, like whether it be, you know, just freestyling for my shows, because I, I don't make lists of questions ever. Um, I take mm -hmm. notes. So I remember the titles of things and character names and whatnot. But otherwise, you just go for it. But as a writer, I am very organized. I use a lot of graphic organizers, which is a fancy way of saying different forms that you fill out, you know, about, you know, character qualities and s plot and setting and whatnot. And I find it more comforting. What was that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what was, so that was a track going by. <laughs> She's, by the way, she's so, on her cell phone, um, so there'll be interesting things that pop into the audio. Yeah, I'm sitting in a parking lot right off of a marina. My <laughs> boat is actually anchored. It's anchored out in the bay. I'm in Solomon's Island, Maryland, and I rode in to, so I could make sure I'd have a decent signal for this conversation. <laughs> Thank you for for doing oh, that. Uh, so what I, it's what I one of the things that I noticed, because uh, I, I did a quick uh, scan of your author page on Amazon, and you mostly write short fiction, or at least that's what a lot of your publications are, but you, you, you also write longer fiction, which sometimes people don't do both. Uh, how do you feel differently when you're writing a shorter piece than when you're working on a novel? Mm. When I'm working on a novel... There's always this feeling in me. It's it's not quite a fear. It's more a looming possibility that I will never get through it all. And I wrote my first complete draft as pretty much a dare to myself. Can I or can I not do something this big? And I did. But the short fiction I write for, I write those for pleasure. I found... Um, erotica erotica readers.com and they've got a, a portion of their website that's for writers that includes a whole list of calls for submissions and what i discovered was that these anthologies are like writing prompts so they say you know we're going to publish a uh one of the ones that just came out i wrote a story called the battle of blair mountain and the, the call for submission was they wanted stories of lesbians during wartime. And throughout history. So she wanted to make sure that she only had one for each war. And it starts in the Civil War and it goes all the way up through time. And I am not the kind of person who finds war to be a stimulating topic for the most part. It's, it's a sad and upsetting thing that happens in the world, but it kind of stuck in my mind. What could I do that would fit the way I think and see the world that would also be an erotic story that would fit this requirement? So these are, these are these puzzles for me. The story I ended up writing is it, it's about um, a couple of my coal miners in West Virginia and this enormous union battle that happened that was the, the only time that the U S military bombs were used against U S citizens here in the U S far out the governor. Yeah. The governor of West Virginia sided with the, uh, the coal mining companies and actually got the, the airplanes that had just come back from world war one to fly over the mountains and bomb these miners. Whoa. Yeah. It's, it's a crazy part of history. The, the battles that were happening, you know, there's, there's been movies and there's been all kinds of things talking about the, the labor organizing that was done and the way that, you know, there were murders and all kinds of really, really horrible things that were going on. But this was the entire structure of the country turning against these people in the hills. And I was, I just had the, the characters came to me almost fully formed and I desperately wanted to write that story. And I sat down and I did. When you're writing 5,000 words or less, you can just 
come up with an idea. And if it's bright enough and if it's intense enough in your head, you can just put it down. And that's what I like about writing the short stuff. So uh, one of the things that I, I've not encountered in um, books that I've read for my show uh, is a coupling between, you know, somebody who sees themselves as a dyke being attracted to um, a masculine genderqueer scientist, which I'm pulling from your, um, <laughs> pulling from your synopsis. Synopsis are so yeah. hard to write. Um, and it was just, it was really interesting and I was like, huh, how would this play, you know, because there's there's a lot of um, separatism in uh, lesbian fiction. So I was like, how is this going to play with audiences? And you had said, I don't remember if we were recording at the time, that you were reading um, reviews of your work to kind of get refamiliarized with the novel. How was it received? Well, I, I debuted the book at Provincetown Women's Week. I I have years and years of history with the lesbian community and but in a kind of a larger way with the queer community. I myself am queer. I am I have a long-term partner who is a cis man and I'm also in an open relationship and date mostly women outside. Now, <laughs> what this means for me is that my experience of community has touched on things like how do lesbians feel when they are going to date somebody who also has men in their lives? And it's something that I, I haven't really wanted to tackle directly in my writing yet, although I've, I'm, I'm thinking about it and I've got a character in mind who might be the person to, to do that. But meanwhile, on a similar but not at all, not, not as personal note, Friends of mine who are genderqueer, who are trans, who are, um, who are just beginning transitions have had to deal with the way that their gender changing has reflected on or not reflected on their partners when they go into a gender transition. So if you've got two women and they're lesbians and they've been together for 20 years and then one of them is transitioning to be male does that or does that not reflect on the partner that is female and not transitioning so these questions come up in my community quite a bit the uh the one that i had not really addressed before the the question that i had i'd seen people not talking about a lot is the question of who who you're attracted to in the first place and how you handle that attraction. Somebody who is really very much a lesbian, part of the lesbian community, feels themselves, understands themselves as a lesbian, and then has an attraction to someone who is very, very masculine, who is a, a trans guy or a genderqueer, uh, trans masculine person again they can have some of those same questions about themselves does it reflect back on me is this putting into any kind of question my own identity and my own feelings um carola the main character in heart of the liliquoi she actually answers that question quite succinctly when one of the other characters comes out and asks so does this mean you're not a lesbian anymore and basically what she says is I'm not really wandering around or I, I'm, I'm not suddenly wandering around the world looking at man asses. I'm still a lesbian. It just so happens that this person is so attractive and so magnetic for me. Yeah. And, and actually I've on a personal level, I've experienced this because um, when I was in college at first, I, came in thinking that I was straight. I was a flaming heterosexual. Um, and I was, <laughs> and I was, you know, and the thing is like, I had not, nothing against uh, folks who are attracted to women. It wasn't that I was trying to sublimate that part of me. Um, I just didn't get sexual attractions to women. So I just assumed that I wasn't until I was 19 and I had a crush. Um, and then I understood myself as bisexual. And then after I graduated college, I dated only women. Oh, yeah. And then identified as lesbian. 
And I met my partner in a lesbian bar that my, um, a party that my friend was running. Um, it was like a lot of times, uh, when it comes to lesbian clubs or whatnot, uh, it's a party that goes to different locations, but doesn't have like a fixed location. That's more, more common, at least in New York city. And, right. um, Seattle and, was like that too. When I lived there and, um, and you know, Ilya, when we were, first talking to each other, like I saw, um, Ilya as a masculine, uh, woman. Um, but, uh, Ilya identifies as trans as a man. And like, we've, <laughs> we've had, like, I joke that I'm a really terrible trans, um, wife because I still use female pronouns, but when it comes to terms of endearment, they're masculine, like husband and poppy and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And, um, I was like, you know, who the question that you ask yourself is like, does this make me any less of a lesbian? Um, and I also don't go around looking at man asses. I'm, you know, when I see (laughs) sexy men on TV, I don't have a flutter of any sort. And I, um, I'm turning 39 and, you know, I graduated almost 20 years ago. And so I don't see myself attracted to men. And I think because Ilya is female bodied and, and won't be transitioning, that that kind of works for the lesbian in me, but I can also respect the other parts um, that are masculine, like you know, wear, you know, wearing suits and identifying a certain way. Um, but it's it's really weird. It's like does does this invalidate my lesbianhood um, to be with someone who identifies as a man? And it's it's this very weird place um, to be in. Right. Now there's all so the other the other side of the story, which I act, I think I remember that you said that Ravi, the the gender queer character in Heart of the Lakoi, his name is Ravi. I think his he's actually um, he was assigned female at birth, and he has had top surgery and nothing else. So and he doesn't even do hormones anymore. He did for a long time. I mean, this is a whole lot of like his his physical information and that may or may not be important in this moment. But the, the sort of flip side of the, I'm just going to go ahead and say it strongly, the lesbian panic of, Oh my God, I like this person. And when we go to bed, I'm going to be saying you and thinking he, and how's this going to go? The flip side is that, a genderqueer person or a trans masculine person can also have sort of the, the mirror image worries. If my partner is really a lesbian and I really have these parts that seem female, does that mean that my partner doesn't respect that I'm a man? Mm-hmm. Now, Ravi doesn't really consider himself a man. He, he, he trans, he's been, in transition for decades now where he's, where his idea of himself and his self conception have, have changed over time. First he would, he thought of himself as a butch woman, but that never really fit right. And then he discovered the trans community and that was a real relief for him. Cause then he felt like he could find a better fit in being a trans man. But the word man started to be, just too much. He didn't want to have to, he didn't want to have to fit into anything like that. So he sort of swung back a bit and calls himself genderqueer because he has both feminine and masculine aspects. And he wants to be able to live those authentically, no matter what. Now, (laughs) once, once you're not living and experiencing yourself as part of the binary, it kind of doesn't matter whether you're going to be with somebody who is straight and sees you as male or female, or whether you're going to be with a lesbian who's going to see you as male or female, you're already, you're already feeling like the person who you're going to be with is going to have to give up some part of that idea, that idea about their own attractions. They're going to have to accept some part of a gender they don't ordinarily find themselves attracted to. And in this, in this, in this specific relationship between the two of them, uh, Carola works in the construction industry. 
she's really, really completely comfortable around men. She has had to more or less top men all her life in order to be able to hold the positions of responsibility that she has. And that the aspects of Ravi that are masculine are actually in the end, the easiest ones for her to accept the ones that surprise her most and give her the most trouble as they get closer and more intimate in the course of the book are the softer aspects. The fact that this is a guy who really wants to talk about feelings. You know, this is a guy who really wants to process when something outrageous happens. He wants to talk it out. And these aspects are the ones that end up taking her by surprise more than his masculine aspects. Now, I I didn't actually get around to answering your question. I got myself a little bit off track about the reception of the book. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's okay that's okay i believe in and yeah. and following the discourse or you know the the narrative however it, it forms itself um yeah but yeah it's it's such i i'm glad that um stories are out there because when i um when i was younger you know freshly out of college and even in college at the time i especially after college, you know, lesbians didn't want to hear about things that had to do with my past that involved, um, sexual relationships with men. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's this sense that you're supposed to erase that. Yes. And any, and any time, you know, and it's any time that it's come up, not, I know that not all lesbians feel this way, but a few times when I've uh, wanted to talk about something and look on their face drops and then they don't want to talk about it. And so when you're young and, you know, I wasn't very popular when I was younger, but I, you know, the, cr- the crowd that I was kind of a part of after college, um, I wanted to be loved, <laughs> you know, and oh, so yeah. I, I sublimated that. And I also, and I know people are going to not like this part, but I did choose to live as a lesbian and to see myself as a lesbian. And that's the identity I chose for myself amongst options. And one of them actually has to sadly do with um, rape culture in that um, I was always very um, free spirited. I love dancing. You know, I love dressing a certain way and acting a certain way that um, could be problematic in straight settings because, you know, men yeah. feel entitlement to your body. Um, may come up and dance on on you or be, you know, in your face or, you know, the concerns that, oh, if somebody I blow off in a club, are they going to be waiting for me like when I'm walking home or something like that? And I've I've never been raped, but I've been I've been in situations where I was frightened. And so being in lesbian bars was so much more comforting to me. And it's not that there aren't shady characters amongst women because there's <laughs> domestic violence and all sorts of things within our own community. But I found that I could be the most of myself, the most free spirited part of myself in that context. And so that's why I chose my life to live my life that way. And after, you know, when your brain kind of rewires itself, that's how I see myself. So and it's, it's strange that I found myself in two different relationships where um, the person's uh, perception of their own personal gender has, has, you know, come up in the face of my own uh, personal identification. And it's a very tug and push and pull thing when it comes to identity. And it's like, I don't want somebody to change mine. Does it change who I am because of how they are? And that that's, you know, that's a complicated question. And that's something that I think growing up in a more binary experience, because now um, teenagers are encountering all sorts of things, and there's so many options, but there were not a lot of options 20 years ago. There wasn't genderqueer there. And I got a lot of flack from both sides if I like to swing from, you know, feminine to masculine clothing and presentation and whatnot. Oh, and, yeah. and so <laughs> it's like, you know, I don't wish I was growing up now because I loved my generation and I loved how I lived my life and I was happy. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, it's, it's such a complicated thing and, um, it's good to have stories out there that are complex because it, it, I always feel that 
publishing, because I publish anthologies too, um, I like making room for new narratives for important spaces with people. And so that's why I kind of appreciate the presence of this kind of story. But I also wonder how, um, how it is received by lesbians, because, you know, you don't know initially um, that this genderqueer person is, is not a man, man, not, a, you know, with the plumbing mm-hmm. of a man. Yeah. It, when I did the, the readings at Women's Week in Provincetown, which is, you know, Provincetown being chock-a-block full of lesbians, I did one that was, um, it was an animal-themed one, uh-huh. and that one was easy, right? It's it's my main character, Carola, walking around with her dog, and then excitement ensues, and the dog saves her, and it's awesome. And then... <laughs> Right. No, there's not, there's nothing bad there. You can't lose with, with dogs saving people. It's always good. But the next reading I did was in the, an erotica panel. And I read this section that I, I picked specifically because it gives, it does give some of the background or some of the, uh, uh, some of the spe- specifics of Ravi's body and how he thinks of it and how he wants to in- wants to interact with Carola sexually so that he can feel the most authentic him and she can, you know, be excited too. And, and it was tremendously powerful for a lot of people in the room because as many times as you're going to hear somebody who just literally didn't want to hear it, just the very fact I was using a masculine pronoun made them not want to hear it. As many times as that happened, just as just as many times as that happened, I had somebody come up to me afterwards and say, you know, I've always felt like the masculine part of me is sort of in danger or is something I have to protect or something I have to hide. And I, I really loved being able to go into this imaginary world and imagine myself as Ravi, somebody who's who's free to be both the 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 two extremes the people who are who are really seeing parts of themselves in this character and the and the people who are seeing nothing for them as a matter of fact things that they wish they hadn't had to listen to they they really do balance each other out and then there's the, this whole group in the middle you know a, a bunch of people who are just listening and finding it interesting to see how two human beings get themselves together, get themselves into scrapes and find intimacy and work it out for each other. Mm -hmm. And I, I do feel like in, in any community, you're going to be able to look around and identify who is in the, who's in the hot seat, who has the most likelihood of being wounded emotionally in any given situation. And that's the person I immediately want to put my arms around and hold on to and protect and help stand up and help speak. And I feel like one of the things I do by writing trans characters is recognize that in my community, in the queer community, you know, not in the community at large, but definitely in the queer community, there are positions of power and there are positions of weakness. And one of those positions of power is to be cisgendered and to neatly fit into either lesbian or gay definitions. People who don't neatly fit, people like me who, you know, I I can use the word bisexual, but I usually just say queer because it takes into account the, pe- the people that I am attracted to who are not part of a binary gender. Um, but I don't fit so neatly, but I can still pretty well take place in these positions of power. I, I can speak and be heard for the most part. I feel like in my community, the people who are having a hard time with that are trans people. Um, I like to uh, suggest other trans writers but while there still aren't a ton of them, I feel like there's there's a place for my writing and a need for me to write these characters. I I appreciate it, and unfortunately, we're we're almost out of time. No, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I've really I, I've enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you for. Uh, 
<laughs> docking to talk with me. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it.